I am interviewing Kimberly Bradley um, and she is a sepsis survivor and her life completely changed. So I'm going to wait for Kimberly to join and I'm just going to hold on a few minutes for her to pop up. So like I said it is an interview with Kimberly Bradley and again a sepsis survivor, her whole life um, completely changed. So I'm just going to hold on for her to join. Thank you for joining me already. Hopefully it shouldn't be too long. Let's wait for her to come on. So I've just invited her in, so hopefully we get the connection. Here she is. Hi, Kimberly. Hi, can you see me? I can. Pull your camera down just a little bit for me. There we go. Hiya, oh, yeah. you all right? Yeah, not too bad. Good. Thank you for joining me this evening. That's okay. <laughs> um, so for everyone that is watching and has joined, I am interviewing Kimberly Bradley um, this evening. She is a sepsis survivor just like myself. However, we have two very different stories. So, Kimberly, would you be able to introduce yourself and just give everyone a brief overview of what you went through and what your experience was? Yeah, sure. Um, I had been fine right up until the minute that I wasn't. <laughs> so I'd, I'd had no illness or no feeling of being unwell. We'd had a great day. Um, I'd been walking on the beach with uh, my husband and daughter. We went to a beer garden. Um, and then when we came back home, I, I was so cold. I just couldn't get a heat in me. Um, and at first I had assumed that it was sunstroke or something it was april it wasn't that hot and yeah. it's scotland it's never going to be like <laughs> scotland, being no. um yeah i just i was shivering and i i put my dressing gown on and blanket on i was just lying on the couch shivering and just thought oh i feel i feel rough um so i thought maybe i would had food poisoning or something um, so, you know, the good old cure-all, I'll go to bed. So I went to bed and started feeling nauseous, and then I was being sick constantly. Um, Nathan was coming to, ch to check on me, um, and he said that I just looked wrong. Worse than just being sick. He was like, there's something really not right. But I was like, I'll be fine, I'll be fine. We'd actually been invited to my mother and father-in-law's for Sunday lunch, for Easter Sunday, the next day. And while I was being sick, all I could think was, my God, she'll already have got the lamb out. She'll oh, be God. prepping. You know, all the silly stuff that I was like, oh, I hope I feel better. Um, and I, I kind of kept dozing in and on and off. Uh, then I remember Nathan coming through and he'd phoned an ambulance and I could hear the paramedic on the phone or the ambulance um, desk. And they were asking him to ask me questions. But I couldn't answer. I was aware that when I tried to speak, it was just noise that was coming out it wasn't words mm. uh, that was the most terrifying thing I thought I was having a stroke or something um and this was all just you know like in an hour <laughs> everything had gone from being a lovely day out on the beach to I can't speak now um I remember the paramedics arriving and as soon as they walked in um, one of them said, that looks like sepsis. And 
I I did not know what that meant. I didn't know um, what was going on. I was then put in the ambulance, and I I don't remember anything else after that. The next thing I know is that I was being woken up and told that it was eight days later and the impact of everything that had happened was explained to me. Um, so that, that was the scariest part, you know, being told afterwards how close I'd come to dying. Not, It just seemed balmy. I was sick and then I'm um, waking up and being told everything that had happened. Oh, uh, honestly, like I've I've been waiting to talk to you for a long time, and I know bits of your story, um, but I didn't realise that it was so quick. Like, yeah, I can't believe how quick, um, and to have such an impact on your life, um, and obviously I'm so thankful and I'm so grateful that you're here talking to me, um, so. Do you know, sort of, do you remember anything from, you know, in the hospital from when you woke up, like, how you felt, um, what, what did they, what, what happened after? Uh, well, I've been told that they tried to take me off the ventilation and reduce the sedation uh, a couple of times, but I, I always reacted badly, mm. um, and I I don't remember that, but I just remember I, I did think that the nurses it, were trying to kill me. Like two in particular, it was a huge conspiracy thing. So when they were trying to take the tubes out, I thought things were going on and no one could see and no one was listening to me. Of course, I wasn't saying anything because I had a tube down my throat. Mm. Um but when I became aware, like, the sedation was off and things, and they told me, um, they ex explained what had happened. At that point, they were still trying to work out what the initial cause mm -hmm. of the sepsis, what the initial uh, infection had been, because they weren't really sure. Um, but then they, uh, they'd they done tests and they found the meningococcal bacteria at the back of my throat um oh. so they think it it was that um rather than um anything other th they they got distracted by the fact that when i was 20 i'd had brain surgery so i've got a like i've got a plastic bubble outside my skull that right needles to go in to, so they can drain brain fluid um, it's been there for 20 years and it's never had any, any harm but they got kind of sidetracked on it must be that and that must be where the infection is so they contacted the old um, neurosurgeon who dealt with that at the time um, and they kind of got stuck on that route for a while I mean the, the cause doesn't really affect how you treat it. Um, uh, so I think they've um, given me the strong antibiotics and everything like that. Um, really, all the pieces came together after speaking to my husband, and he was able to explain everything that happened and how how serious it had been. Um, so that I was then able to ask the doctors a bit more because um, they'd had the call on the on the Monday night. Uh, my daughter had been at her dad's while this had happened. She'd been with us in the morning. She'd gone away to her dad's in the afternoon. Um, so Nathan hadn't actually told her what was going on um, initially. But then it got to a point where the doctors had said that you need to phone everyone to come in because like, the next few hours are critical and she might not make it. It was a, it was a real 50-50. We don't know. It could go away. Um, 
so hearing that you're just like I mean obviously it was happening to me mm. but I was oblivious I have no idea what was going on at the time. so I, I, I really feel for what my family went through watching and being powerless mm. I think that's that's the harder thing to deal with. I've got that guilt of what they went through and I, I can't understand how it would have been to watch me. Mm. I, I, fully, I fully understand how, how you feel in, in that sense and I, I completely understand um, that that sort of aspect is very hard to talk about. Um, obviously, I've spoken about my experience with mm -hmm. when when um, I was admitted into hospital and I was on my own and again like you being told that you've got sepsis and not knowing what it, what it is and no. you know no no you cannot explain to anyone um, how, what that feeling feeling is like and you know that heart racing moment of oh okay well what is it um, and then you know having them contact your family I completely I completely understand and I feel exactly the way that you do. Um, and I do get very emotional when I think about it myself. Because you think if it was you being told that about them, you wouldn't know what to do, would you? Yeah. Um, so I completely understand that that aspect is very hard to talk about and is one of the harder aspects to deal with. Um, how, obviously, I know that your family have been so supportive of you haven't they they really yeah. have been incredible yeah absolutely I mean I wasn't able to like when I came back I don't think I had understood once I moved to I was in the intensive care unit for a while um, then I got moved to the renal intensive care because my kidneys had failed so I was on um, dialysis constantly um, so I, w I was always lying down and the first time I tried to stand up they tried to get me out, they had the big crane thing that they hook the belts around and get to lift it up. I'm thinking, right, go on, just, just give me a wee shoulder to lean on and I'll be up, it'll be fine. Mm -hmm. It felt like they were doing a lot of harnessing and things and I'm like, I'll be fine. But the first time I stood up, I was like, I cannot feel like I have got no strength, none, none whatsoever. And by the time I left the hospital, I'd been in the ward for a few weeks. I was walking with a swimmer thing, but I still had my, my feet were still black. Um, so they were all bandaged up and it was hard to move easily. So when we when I then got home, there's this sort of there's not the nurses able to bring things to you and everything. It was just like you're fine now. But I really wasn't. Mm. <laughs> without um without Nathan being able to like lift me, carry me, put me to bed, dress me put me on the toilet. It was constantly having to make sure I was eating, drinking properly. Um, because my kidneys were still completely shot, I needed to make sure that I was measuring how much I drank and how much I went to the loo and all the, the balancing up. But that all fell to Nathan because there was, that's just how it is. You, you go home from hospital and it's like, that's that's it. Um, it took ages for the like support network of district nurses and physio um, and OTs. All that like took months and months before that kicked in. Um, so I mean, we've been married five years now. Um, I wasn't really prepared for that level of care being needed so early in our relationship. Um, 
kind of think you're going to be in your 70s and 80s before they're going to have to lift you off the toilet. Um, but he he was amazing, absolutely amazing. And my daughter, um, she's just she's been cooking, cleaning. Um, she, she would bring me through to the kitchen. I'll sit on the stool, and she's like, right, instruct. So she's making the meals and constantly bringing me cups of tea. They may be lukewarm, but they are made. Um, yes. It's the effort. <laughs> yes, definitely. It's the effort. She sounds amazing. Um, uh, especially, how old is she? How old is your daughter? Uh, she's 15 now. So she was 14 at the time. Um, that's a, a hell of a lot for a 14 year old. It really is, isn't it? Um, but you know, you sound like you've got an amazing support system um, around you and you know with that they are a credit to you um, and obviously I'm, I'm aware because I've spoken to you about them before haven't I and how amazing they was throughout the whole process. Yeah. Um, so you said that the, the care um, from the professionals <laughs> took a while to sort of set in. Um, is that a concern? Do you think that it should be sooner? Oh, absolutely. I had to had to really kind of stick up for myself to get things. Um, and I didn't feel like it should be. I thought on discharge from hospital, there should be, this is what's coming next. You will have the district nurses come into you. You will have a physiotherapist come to you all these things because for the first few months you know my my dressings on my feet were just not getting changed until somebody kind of then starts that process and you're like I could get another infection and then die because of that gap um and it just felt so bammy to me that you know Weeks before, I was in a coma in intensive care, and then them just like waved out the door. Like, That's fine. It's perfectly acceptable. I just um, I was very disappointed in that as aspect because my care in the hospital had been phenomenal. Yeah. But then when I when I've had the nurses have been amazing. The um, the physio, the OT, they're all amazing. It's just. There wasn't the joined upness um, of what happens next. And when I, when I left the hospital, my my feet were still black, completely black, um, and my fingertips, my nose, and my tongue. And it was just like what what. Will they stay like this? Is anyone going to do anything? What happens? Um, and eventually I got to see someone. And the, I know from speaking to other people in the various sexist groups um, and people that, you know, I've met through you, um, they've had amputations while in hospital at the time of their infection. Uh but my experience in, in the hospital I was in, in Edinburgh, they prefer to just leave your digits and whatever to auto-amputate. Now, being told that, <laughs> my head was just like, you yeah, what? <laughs> that, that was just sorry, like... Sorry, that, that's thrown me. So yeah, just if you leave them, they'll just fall off on their own. So my toes were completely black. They were dead. If you leave them, they'll just fall off on their own. And the, the thought behind that is that if they amputate, they're causing a wound, which is a potential infection site. Plus, they don't know how much healthy tissue might be lying underneath the black. So it's better in the long run you might have you might lose less if you leave it to just fall off on its own 
But that then meant that I had 11 months of counting down how many toes I had left, still getting dressings, having it just like that. Whereas I personally, I understood their their logic. It does make sense. Mm. But at the same time, 11 months is a long time to have black toes waiting for them to fall off. Every day you're kind of like, oh, will today be the day? And, you know, you find yourself having the strangest conversations with friends. Like, oh, have you lost um, Then eventually in March, um, when I went for a check-up up at the hospital, as soon as um, the, the nurse went to get me, he asked me how I was doing and I burst into tears. Because I was like, I can't do this anymore. I'm just, it's so, I can't put any pressure on. It's just, like, I'm done. So they then took me in and agreed to amputate the last three. So they were, they were amputated in March. Just before, I got out the week before lockdown happened. So I'm kind of thinking, you know, potentially, if I hadn't, broken down at that point, then I might still have those hanging on stupid black toes um, waiting. Because I can, when I was in the hospital, when I was in the hospital, there there was talk of, you know, the coronavirus and everything, and you could see different areas of the hospital were starting to prepare for that. Um, So I, I was so grateful to have been taken in to get that operation just so that I can now sort of move forward. So you've got a sense of relief now? Yeah. Yeah. No toes, but relief that that's now that bit's done. Mm. So I now just need to wait for the orthotic department to work seeing people again. Yeah. And they, they'll need to do, I don't know, special shoes or prosthetics or they can do amazing things um you know i don't know whether you've ever spoken to kim smith um she is yeah exactly i i i literally have no words to describe no i know on the days when i i I was annoyed about my toes i think well she's got no hands i my fingertips were all black but that it was just like layers of skin and they just peeled off and they're still numb on the end, but I have them. I can use them. Yeah. And I, I don't know, I don't know how I would have coped without, but I guess when you speak to her, she's like, well, you just do. Exactly. And like from when I've spoken to her um, personally, um, she just gives me this sense of, you just need to be grateful for, what you have um yeah. and i know that um quite a few people have commented saying that you are just incredible um and so i you really are um and i'm just yeah. i i can't i can't even describe how i'm feeling listening to you um and i know i'm gonna look back and my eyes are gonna be watery and i'm like jess mate no um <laughs> But that is just, I just, I can, I've got no words. Um, I just think you're so brave. I think you're incredible. I think your family is amazing. Um, Now, obviously, if you're okay to talk about how you feel now, like, have you got any post-sepsis sort of syndrome? Obviously, mentally, this this must have been so hard. Um, Yeah. Have you had the support there? For things like that, and obviously, I know the UK, uh, the UK Sepsis Trust are amazing. Um, yeah, have, they've been you, great. have you had any? How can you describe the support that you've had after in regards to post sepsis syndrome and also through the trust or any other support groups? Um, medically, I've not been, um, I've not been given any specific diagnosis. And I found it hard to separate what is still recovering from that horrific thing that happened um, 
to where I'm at now and how much of it is potentially just I am now stuck with the thing. Um, I'm getting so tired. Like Nathan wakes me up for lunch. He's working in the, the other room every day from home, thankfully, because of the, the coronavirus. You know, it's one of the positives. I now have people at home. Um, but yeah, I, I sleep right through. And if he didn't wake me up, I would just keep sleeping. Um, and I have, I've, I, we've talked about this before, like the brain fog. Mm, it's terrible. I, it's so frustrating. Um, I mean, I was I was a team leader. I organised. I I love an Excel spreadsheet. I would have everything colour coded, and just now I can't even do the online shopping. You know, we end up with randomness. <laughs> Nathan's going, "What are we having for tea?" I'm like, "I don't know. No, I don't what? know what order. I don't know how it's happened." Um, it's better some days than others. Other some days there's just like I I can't find the words for anything. Um and it's just that constant frustration because I know that I should be a better than this. Um but on the on the other side I um Previously, I had like anxiety and depression sometimes. I'd kind of got to a good place in that I had found a way, you know, I put music on and I would walk. I'd walk for miles. I would come home feeling good about myself, feeling positive. I can't do that now. Um, I'm kind of stuck in the house. Nathan can take me out and I'll go on my mobility scooter round the block, I find a nice flat bit of flat straight bit of pavement and I'll use my crutches and I can walk between two lampposts and that's as far as I can do. But saying that I I'm I'm sort of grateful for this experience to make me realise that anything I was depressed about before is so crazy and insignificant. Um, so I, I have got like a new positive outlook. Um, all those kind of insecurities. Does does Nathan really love me? And am I a good mum? And all those things. You're like, do you know what? I have no questions now. I know that my family is solid. Um, I may not be the best wife or the best mum right now because I'm physically not capable. But emotionally, I'm, I'm being there and I can do what I can do. Um, the the UK trust, UK Sexist Trust um, have been great. The only thing is there's only one peer support group in Scotland. Oh, okay. And it's in Glasgow. So for the whole of Scotland, there's one. And that's just down to, there's less people here. Um, so we had been talking about trying to set one up in Edinburgh. Um, but then obviously lockdowns happened. There have been virtual ones, which have been great. Um, I know Kim organised one. So just being able to speak to other people, there's there's... Facebook groups and those kind of things have been uh, invaluable, I think, to speak to other people who understand what it is you're going through. And, you know, the, the kind of flashbacks that I've got to the crazy dreams or delirium that happened while I was in the hospital... Um, you know, when I talk to friends and family, it becomes a laugh, you know, some of the wild things that I thought were going on. Um, but at the time, it wasn't funny. It was scary. So being able to speak to other people who have had that and who 
experience those kind of thinking the nurses are trying to kill you is it's not funny when you're there and powerless so I think um, without that support um, I think things would have been lacking so again I think that if on discharge you could be put in touch with the relevant groups um, on leaving the hospital I think that would be better Absolutely. I, I, you know, I agree with you 100% now. Um, when you are discharged, for anyone watching this, because I know that people are popping in and popping out of uh, the live, um, but the good thing is that this is all recorded and is going to be put on YouTube and it's on my Instagram and it will go on Facebook and people will be able to relate uh, when I think they watch this back. Um, but when you are discharged from hospital and you've had sepsis, there is no mention of the UK Sepsis Trust. None no. at all. Um, and when I was discharged, I didn't I didn't even have a follow up from my doctor. Mm. I was strictly, you're good to go. That's it. Um, there was no you could suffer with nightmares, you may suffer with memory loss, you may suffer with hair loss, you may suffer with um mental health issues there is you're not told anything when no. you leave um and yep someone has literally just commented saying they they haven't heard of them either um so i think that that is something that does need to change Definitely. Um, you know a, a, across the country um and obviously i can try and make it another little mission of mine um, with the people behind me because um, I think I think people do need to know I've spoken to people that have never even heard of the UK Sepsis Trust yeah. and, they need, and people need them they are an incredible charity with the support there for people yeah. to go through what myself and, and yourself have been through um, and for parents that have lost children to sepsis as well they have the bereavement side of it. Um, but again, there's no mention of the UK Sepsis Trust and that is something that does need to change. Um, yeah. They are amazing. Um, have you ever, just a quick, uh, I'm going to throw in a quick question here. Have you ever suffered with memory loss? Yes. Mm, me yeah, too. Absolutely. And um, it's not something that I'd ever dealt with before. Um, that I mean obviously everyone walks into a room and forgets why they're there at some point but it, it can be like whole periods of time that I just go and conversations that I can't remember having um, so I mean now having a conversation with my mum who can't remember a lot of what she said we're constantly telling each other the same things over and over again. Um, it's quite, yeah. Another perk. It's one of these things. Yeah. I, I, you mentioned hair loss. Um, I, I shaved my head after losing all my hair because the, the mental aspect of losing your hair was so demoralising. Because it, it didn't happen till I'd been out of the hospital for about three months, and then my hair started to fall out. I'm like, I should be, I should be getting better by now. But there was that then delay, and then my hair started falling out. I'm like, right. So that's why I shaved it all off, and it's now come back in sort of curly, which is. There we go. You got a new style, haven't you? Do you know what? That's so strange because I've spoken to people that have had um, hair loss. And it's not one of them things that people put two and two together. Um, and, you know, I didn't have hair loss, but my hair set alight. Um, my hair went up in flames at the hairdressers, um, sadly. Um, and I can, that, that feeling of, oh, like, you're, you're, it's your hair, isn't it? Yeah. It, it makes us who we are. Um, and I sadly had to have mine cut quite short. Um, and 
my partner, as amazing as he is, he paid for me to have extensions all put in and it wasn't until la end of last year or this year did I have them out fully. I think I spoke mm -hmm. to you about that. Um, but, you know, for people that do go through the hair loss, it is a massive mental strain. Um, yeah. Because it's your identity and people don't put the two and two together with having sepsis and hair loss. How do you... Yeah. It's not something... That, that... Yeah, I don't know if it's just because I had been... Uh, like, during the, the sepsis, everything shuts down. Because obviously that's yeah. how your hands and your feet go black. Is because all the, the blood is pulled just to your organs to kind of keep them going. So I think the hair, your nails, I had like the funny little steps in my nails where, you know, it just stopped, everything stopped. And that's why your hair falls out. But you kind of, yeah, it seems cruel because I just started to feel like I was maybe recovering. Yeah. And then that, and you're like, oh, fuck. Come on. Give me a break. Yeah, I, I completely understand. I do. And the one thing that gets me and, you know, like you can talk to people about it. And, you know, when I said this interview was going to be super chilled out and just like a general conversation, um, things like this do just pop into my mind. So it's a little bit off track. Um, but with the memory loss is I will put things down and I'll forget. And then, and then I'm in a frantic search for something that I have just put down. And then mm. I get myself so worked up because I should know where I've put that, you know. Um, my, my major one was with my phone. Um, we use our phones 24-7. And I forgot my, I woke up one morning and I forgot my code. How can you forget your code into your phone? And yeah. I was putting it in, putting it in, putting it in, getting a panic on. And I had to wipe my whole phone just because I couldn't remember my code that I had been using the day before all day. And then uh. I woke up one morning and it was gone. Couldn't remember it. And I get so frustrated with... The, the memory loss side of it because it's not something that you can explain to someone um, and they go well how can you not remember that and it's I can't I, it's something you can't explain to anyone unless they've gone through it um, yeah and that's why I find doing what I do with all of you it's kept me sane because you know you're not on your own yeah definitely definitely 100% um, um Someone's actually just commented saying um, that they also get memory loss. Um, and it's the same with her hair. Mm. So, you know, this is why these interviews do work, because it makes people think that they know that they're not on their own. Um, so um, my last few, I've got one more question for you is, what is your one message just one message it can be as long or as short as you like that you want to say to people about sepsis awareness and why they should be aware and why they should be grateful for the life that they have now okay um sepsis awareness i think if that paramedic hadn't immediately recognized it was sepsis i was very fortunate in that and i have heard so many sad stories where people didn't know that that's what they had and the doctors didn't know that that's what they had. And by the time it's been figured out, it's too late. Just like my, my life was on that night thing, it wasn't clear to any medical professional. They couldn't call it. Time is everything in that situation and getting the antibiotics into you as quickly as possible. Um, so just to be your own advocate, if you're in a position and you see something that you think, I don't know. I mean, I, I had said to Nathan, don't you dare call an ambulance. I am being sick and I'm cold. Calm yourself down. We've all been here before. We've been sick. It's fine. And But 
he stood by his guns, even though I was saying I'm fine. And he knew that there was something more to it. So he phoned the ambulance. So I, there's various points that I think there's other people's stories that didn't go that way, that they didn't react. Um, and that's why I'm here now, because Nathan called the ambulance. The paramedic knew it was sepsis, and he started, while I was in the ambulance, they started putting the relevant things into me. Um, the more people that know about it and how, how commonplace it can be, like, and from the most mundane things, I mean, uh, the, the interview that you'd done, um, I can't remember her name, the girl in Australia, who it was toothache. Yeah. Or not even toothache, it was her wisdom tooth that caused an infection and she had no pain, but the infection had caused sepsis. It can be UTIs, it can be a chest infection, it can be anything, a cut that gets infected. Um, and I think when I have seen sepsis portrayed on medical dramas, for example, it's always like a big festering wound that has led to sepsis, if they ever mention it. It's never from your everyday infection that something goes so terribly wrong. And I don't know if that's because it would scare the bejesus out of everyone if they actually knew how just like one day your body will just completely overreact to an infection. Um, so even simple things like if you've got a urine infection, go to the doctor, get antibiotics. I know that there's this, you'll get resistant, etc. Please just don't take infections lightly because it just takes that one for your body to go crazy. Absolutely. Um, what, what an amazing message um, to everyone. And it very much relates to what I say in every interview is that time it is all about time um so yeah you know exactly the same as what kimberly said if you don't feel right if you don't feel normal um and if you know the signs and symptoms you know please go to the uk sepsis trust website please go to the world sepsis day website as well um and just become aware with what to look out for especially if you've got young children um and you know if you're young, uh, like myself, and you know the signs and symptoms, you might spot something if your parent isn't very well. So it's always about knowing the signs, symptoms, and just being aware. Um, and this is the end of today's interview. Um, so I'm so, I'm so thankful that you've come on and spoken to me today. Um, I think this is the last interview <laughs> that I've done. Um, but Honestly, I, I can't even, the look on my face just says it all. I'm, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by your story. Um, when I get off of here, I'm probably going to have a little cry um, because I'm just... So will I. I'm, I'm in awe of you. I really am. Um, and by the looks of the comments, so many people are. Um, many people are saying, you're incredible. Thank you for sharing. It brings a lot of things to light. Memory loss, brain fog nerve endings hair loss no energy and much more thank you so much for letting me join in today well done to the both of you well done ladies and so much more um heart eyes by <laughs> sarah um and yeah just please give love to your friends and family because they're amazing and yeah i'm gonna leave it there and this is going to be saved on to youtube and also on my story for anyone that hasn't watched. But thank you for joining me today. Um, it's been a well, pleasure. Thank you very much. And keep yeah. doing what you're doing. Oh, I will. You know I will. It's my mission. All right, Angel. Right. I will speak to you soon. And don't forget, we've got a hashtag around the world in 13 days coming up. Yep. Which I know you're taking part in. And Sepsis Awareness Month and World Sepsis Day. 
on the 13th of September. So anyone that is watching, please be sure to share the campaign because we need to get it around the world again. Um, but other than that, thank you. Thank you for watching and thank you just for being a part of today. Take care. Bye. Take care, my love.